Hi, y'all. Welcome to Module 1, Lesson 1. You are embarking on an incredible journey, and you are 100% in the right place to be the most informed and savvy buyer possible. In this lesson, we'll go over what mortgage lending is and the three things they'll look for when you're applying for a mortgage loan. The most important investment you can make is in yourself. We want to cover the actual costs of buying a house first because it's what most of our buyers are most anxious and curious about. Without knowing exactly how much money you'll need, it's impossible to know whether you're ready to buy. This holds many people back from even getting started. Before we dig in, I want to explain exactly what mortgage lenders do. So when we say lender, you'll know what we're talking about. Even though mortgage lending feels very overwhelming, it's actually pretty simple. Mortgage lenders are the bank or financial company that lends money to people looking to buy a home. When most people buy a house, they need to get a loan to cover a majority of the price of the house. Your down payment is the portion of the cost that you cover up front, and then the rest is covered by the loan you get from your lender. To make sure you can pay the loan back through monthly payments, they'll ask you to submit a variety of documents like pay stubs, tax returns, bank statements, and they'll perform a credit check. Lenders live in a financial world that can sometimes feel like they speak a different language. Their job is not only to help you get a loan, but also to help the bank make a smart investment in you. If they gave loans to just anyone without checking all their financials, they would spend a lot of time chasing down their money. Keep this in mind when they're asking you to bear your financial soul. We're going to walk you through exactly how lenders look at your finances so you'll be perfectly prepared to apply for your first home loan. There are three main variables your lender considers when approving you for a mortgage. Income, credit score, and your debt-to-income ratio. Sort of like when you're deciding whether to date someone or not. They'll gather all the information and then ask deeper questions if anything is unclear. Now that you know what a lender does, let's talk about how they look at your income. Remember, they're about to lend you a lot of money, so they need to make sure you're not a liability. There are two main categories of income, W-2 and self-employed. Lenders really like W-2 employees because it's very easy to verify your income when you make the same amount on a predictable schedule. Don't worry if you don't have a regular paycheck. We'll get to your category soon. W-2 employees receive regular paychecks, their employer deducts taxes from each of those paychecks, and all of that information is filed with the government, so lenders view it as extra legitimate. Again, even though lenders love a W-2, this does not mean a self-employed income is illegitimate in the eyes of a lender. Your agent should give you a lender referral who is very experienced with different types of income and will be able to guide you through the process no problem. Some of you might receive bonuses at work on top of your base salary. Of course you do! I assume that because you're taking this course, you're impeccably well-researched and forward-thinking. If you're a W-2 employee who earns commission or bonuses, that extra amount can be used to count towards your income, depending on how regularly you earn them. You go, you overachiever, you. On to you self-employed folks. Any other type of income is considered self-employment, which includes working for yourself, freelancing, contracting, or owning a business like we do. Other ways to know that you fall into the self-employed category are that your income may be different each month and you're responsible for withholding, filing, and paying your own taxes. Unfortunately, the lending industry hasn't kept up with the rapidly growing gig economy. You probably know tons of people who work contract positions, are freelance, or have their own business. We do too. Luckily, Open House has formed good relationships with lenders who love helping self-employed people navigate the murky waters of mortgage lending. Lenders generally like to see at least two years of tax returns coming from the same gig or industry. Lenders use these two years of income to calculate your gross monthly income by adding up what you earned over the past two years and dividing by 24 months. For example, if you earned $150,000 total over the past two years, 
which is roughly $75,000 per year. Lenders will divide $150,000 by 24 months to get your gross monthly income of $6,250. There are some exceptions to this rule. Some lenders will be able to use just one year of your taxes if your credit score is high enough. I encourage you to talk to a lender before coming to conclusions on your own. It's easy to get discouraged by the rules, but you might be surprised what you learn. To this day, every time I apply for a mortgage, they don't tell me exactly what I was expecting based on my own finances. We will say this often in this course, but I highly recommend building a relationship with a lender sooner rather than later. Let's talk strategy. If you are in the self-employed category, you'll need to be pretty mindful of how you file your taxes two years before buying a house. If you claim an overall loss on your taxes, you may A, not get approved for the price you were hoping, or B, not get approved at all. As you know, I own my own business, Open House, ever heard of it? So when I'm planning to buy a house, I make sure to let my CPA know that I want to show enough income to be approved for the amount of money I want to spend on a house. It might mean that I'll have to write off fewer expenses and pay more in taxes, but to me, it's worth it to be able to be approved for the mortgage. We also highly recommend that you work with a CPA to help you navigate your income. Your tax return is a huge part of your approval, so getting this right is worth it. If you're planning to take the leap from a regular W-2 paycheck to a freelance or contract position or start that business anytime soon, I urge you to consider buying a house before you quit your job. With a brand new self-employed income, it's harder to buy a house once you don't have a regular paycheck. An open house buyer wanted to quit his job to start his own business, but after speaking with one of our agents, he decided to first use that W-2 income to purchase a house. He knew he would be able to cover the mortgage payment via house hacking, even without his job. House hacking is a term you'll hear a lot at open house, and the simplest definition is renting a portion of your house to pay some or all of your mortgage payment. Unfortunately, the banks need to see that hard financial proof of income in your W-2. After he closed, he was free to quit that job and pursue his dream while enjoying the stability and perks of homeownership. You might be thinking, well, shoot, I just launched my business, so I'll have to wait two whole years to buy my first house. Wrong. At Open House, we are all about partnerships. We love being creative with financing. Once you know the basics of mortgage lending, you can use that knowledge to find the perfect partner who will equally benefit from the partnership. Partnering is the best way to strengthen your buying power if you can't get approved on your own. Buying power is a fancy way to say how easily and how much you're able to be approved for a mortgage. I, personally, have utilized partnerships very heavily in my past purchases. I've partnered with friends, family, business partners, you name it. The simplest way to partner is to buy a house with someone who would live in that house with you, called an occupying co-borrower. This could be a friend, your significant other, or anyone you'd feel good about sharing a home with. You can also partner with a non-occupying co-borrower who would go on the loan and the deed with you, but won't actually live in the house. For example, this could be a parent or a friend who lives somewhere else, but wants to invest in your city with you. They could even live in the same city, want to live in their current home, but still want to invest in real estate with you. The possibilities are endless with a bit of mindset shift. A partnership might also be helpful if you have that coveted W-2 job, but don't have enough cash saved to buy a house. If you're ready to buy a house and you're a super strong borrower with little to no savings, you could partner with someone who has more cash, but might not have as much buying power in the eyes of a lender. There are so many ways to use partnerships to your advantage. You never know who might be down to partner with you until you ask. In the investor track, we will tell you how we've partnered to grow our real estate portfolio faster and show you exactly how you can utilize partnerships as well. 
That was a slight but useful tangent. Let's bring it back to the three variables your lender looks at. We just covered income. Now we're on to your credit score. At Open House, we feel a certain type of way about credit scores, but they're used to determine how likely it is that an applicant will repay a loan on time. So they're important to understand and look at. They're sort of like an adult GPA based on some counterintuitive metrics. There are three credit score benchmarks to keep in mind. 580 is the lowest possible score to be approved for a mortgage. 620 is when things start getting a little nicer for you. You start getting more favorable loan terms and slightly better interest rates. 760 or above is the gold standard. That score will typically get you the best terms and the lowest rates. For all my fellow perfectionists out there, you don't actually have to worry about reaching 800 as long as you're above 760. A tiny insight into credit score. 35% of your credit score is based on your payment history, such as on time or late payments. And 30% is based on your credit usage or the percentage of your credit limit you're currently using. This is great because those are two factors you have the most control over. If your credit score is lower than you like it to be, here are three quick things you can do to improve it. Request a credit limit increase. This is good if you're using a large portion of your credit limit. Pay down certain high interest consumer debt and review your credit report and dispute any derogatory marks. If you want to dive deeper into these strategies, head to the extra credit resources in this module and listen to the How to Boost Your Credit Score episode of our podcast. On to the third and final variable that your lender will consider, your debt to income ratio or DTI. Debt to income ratio compares how much you owe each month to how much you earn. Lenders use this number to figure out how much you can feasibly afford to pay towards your mortgage each month. This includes your car payment, credit card payments, student loan payments, and any other loans you may have. This does not include your monthly rent. To calculate this ratio, lenders divide your monthly debt payments by your gross monthly income. Lenders look for a DTI of under 50%, including your new mortgage payment. This is to make sure that you have that extra 50% of your income to go towards other expenses and to make sure you have plenty of money coming in each month to pay them back. The lower the DTI, the more confident a lender will feel about your finances. Think closer to 30%. For example, if your gross monthly income is $6,250 and your monthly debt payments are $1,500, your DTI is 24%. You'll calculate your DTI in the homework for this module. If your DTI is higher than you expected, there are a couple ways to lower it. You can decrease or pay off debt, starting with your credit cards, or you can increase your income by asking for a raise or getting a different job. Misconception alert. You have to pay off all your debt before you buy a house. Not true. I have purchased over 10 homes and I still have student loans to this day. It's all about knowing your numbers, keeping high interest consumer debt to a minimum and having a super clear debt plan. Lenders will not turn you away for having some debt. Circling back to our recommendation that you talk to a lender first before drawing conclusions about your financial situation. If your student loans, car, and credit card payments aren't a large percentage of your gross monthly income, then it won't stop you from being approved for a mortgage. Are you ready for math class? Let's go through a quick example. If you have a $250 monthly student loan payment, a $400 monthly car payment, a credit card minimum payment of $179 a month for a total of $829 per month, and your gross monthly income is $4,800, then you divide your monthly debt payments by your gross monthly income, which would make your DTI 17%. 50% is the max DTI, 
and 2,400 is 50% of 4,800. We subtract your total monthly debt payments from 50% of your income to get your maximum monthly mortgage payment. This person could afford a monthly payment of around $1,571 because their previous debt plus their new mortgage payment equals 50% of their gross monthly income. Like we said, lenders won't lend over 50% DTI. If you're someone who is looking at this like, whoa, I don't want to do all this math, that's a-okay. That's literally part of your lender's job to do this for you. But we like to keep you all informed so you know where these numbers are coming from. So to recap, the three key variables lenders look at are employment and income, credit score, and DTI. Once you calculate your DTI, your path to homeownership becomes so much clearer. If you find that your DTI is a bit high, use what you know to lower that baby. In most cases, people are pleasantly surprised by how low their DTI actually is. Hooray! You'll be a homeowner in no time. Your choice to enroll in homeschool and get clear on your financials will pay off in droves. In the homework for this module, you'll gather all your financial information in one place, which is the most important starting point. In the bonus video of this module, we'll help you come up with a clear path to lower your DTI.